Welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on current trends and timeless advice for surviving in the aesthetics industry. Whether you're an injector, practice owner, sales rep, or marketer, it's time to set the record straight. Each week, we cut through the chaos and showcase diverse perspectives and winning ideas from the best minds in the industry. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Hall, Chief Growth Officer at Aesthetic Record. Now, let's get started on this week's episode. Hello and welcome to For the Record, an unfiltered view on surviving in aesthetics. We have got a fun episode today. I'm your host, Tiffany Lopez, and we have a special guest, Crystal Dernan from Of Me Aesthetics, who is like my beauty, I don't know, my beauty beacon. So she's always on Instagram looking fabulous, working out, working in her big medical spa chain, being a a beauty boss, and also being an amazing asset to her clinic and to her employees. So I am thrilled today to have her on with us. And uh, if you guys know her, if you've seen her, you know that she's drop dead gorgeous. So we were just talking about our lashes off camera and how much we love our lashes. I may give you some beauty tips while we're on our podcast today. But Crystal is part of Of Me Aesthetics and has been from the very beginning. So they went from one clinic um, in Atlanta to now they have five. And I think they're going to keep growing and growing. They've got an amazing brand that is just a, a beacon for our industry as well. It's just phenomenally done. She's got a great culture with her employees. She's got great hiring practices. So we have a lot to learn today about how to be better and how to survive in the chaotic world that we all love, which is aesthetics. So Krista, welcome to our podcast. We're glad to have you. Thank you so much, Tiffany, and you're really too kind. Um, And I definitely would love to share any beauty tips because (laughs) that's my passion and why I'm in this industry. Um, yeah, that's why we all are, right? We want, to, we want to look young and beautiful. So we all signed up to work in aesthetics. I know. I always say, look, we're all aging and I'm not going down without a fight. <laughs> Same. Well, Crystal, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and a bit about your background and what makes you such a badass person to run all these clinics because you do such a great job. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, keep up really with the people that I work with. And I think part of that is just surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, and I was really fortunate, actually, I came to of me initially three months after they opened in their first um, location here in Buckhead. And I came in as a client and I really just fell in love with the brand. Um, I always joke that I'm their best client because they couldn't get rid of me here. I still am. And, um, you know, just to take a step back, um, I started getting kind of exposed to the aesthetics industry kind of just through happenstance. I went to graduate school at University of Miami for architecture. And while I was there, I got a job working as a office manager at a little medical concierge doctor's office who primarily did general medicine, but he had all of his clients ask him all the time to come to (laughs) give him, uh, give them Botox and, you know, different neurotoxins. And um, he kind of got into the aesthetics world that way. And I was exposed to it. And, you know, I really just kind of at 23 started learning about it from the inside world. And from there, my love affair began, (laughs) Um, you know, I did, um, my degree and I went on to work in architecture doing business development and I really just continued to do this on the side just for myself and I kind of became a little guru in terms of you know my my friend circle I was always giving people advice what works what doesn't don't waste your money on that and so forth so I was always kind of trying everything I lived in LA so you know I had exposure to a lot of incredible um, services there And, you know, I just started thinking, I'm like, why am I giving this advice for free? Somebody should be paying me for this. Exactly. And, you know, they say, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And honestly, I feel that I am constantly working. So that's not necessarily true, but I really do love what I do. um, And I do do this probably every day, um, you know, gladly. And, um, you know, just in terms of what I do at Of Me, I, um, right now I'm, depending on what day you ask, really, I'm the director of people and culture and slash the director of talent acquisition. So I kind of ride the line between those two roles right now. We are still in startup mode. Um, So, you know, we're running on a lean team. And so we we all are wearing different hats. And, you know, that's what I love about it is I really get my hands into kind of every aspect of the business. But I love people. So anything as it relates to people, um, 
is really what I do. So I would say that the main, the main uh, things that I'm focused on is really kind of our cultural initiatives, um, you know, performance ma management, ta talent acquisition, engagement and retention of staff. Um, I do onboarding and training with the new hires, which is really fun. It's kind of like your first day of school. And I'm, I uh, manage our national PR efforts in our different studios as well. Oh, it's, it's interesting. I think that's why I was so drawn to you because my background is in organizational development. So okay. I, I've done my PhD is in people management or I call them like asset, you know, people asset management. And people always say to me, well, that's not really a revenue driver. There's not really profitability. How do you measure if you're good at talent development? And to me, it's like, it's not a matter of profitability. It's if you don't do it well, the company will suffer forever. Like it's more of a money losing battle if you don't do it well, than if you do it well, you're able to be profitable. So I think about the things that, you know, you think about with talent acquisition, who do you hire? How do you train them? How do you onboard them? I feel like in our small industry, to your point, a lot of us are still in startups that that gets missed so much. And that's like the single biggest driver to success. We are a people intensive business. So I give you all my kudos and to, um, and to Mark, your owner, for realizing that this particular role is critical in a med spa to be successful. So I am so eager to hear all of your advice today about how to hire and fire and keep the culture going. Um, no, and I absolutely agree. I mean, I think that the number one thing that I feel, you know, really fortunate about is the fact that, you know, Mark really values culture. That's not always the case. I've never worked necessarily for a, co a company where there was so much emphasis on the culture. Um, and, you know, I think that that's really ultimately when you're growing any business, um, you know, and especially ours, we see human capital as, you know, the most invaluable asset that we have. And he feels that way, thankfully. Um, and it really just makes my job that much more easy when I have somebody that, um, you know, believes in that and, you know, backs me 100% and, um, you know, inspires me to continue to just really just focus on brand and culture and, you know, attracting, retaining um, the right people that align with our culture. Well, I'll tell you this, our podcast is really focused on how you survive in aesthetics because I think aesthetics is like a dog eat dog world in many ways or people are sharks and you guys are growing this this business rapidly I think in 2017 you had one location now you have five as you think about your role in scaling across the country what's the biggest challenge that you see in growth right now in aesthetics and I know COVID is going to be a whole different issue but just let's even say pre-COVID what was your biggest challenge personally um I would say you know what keeps me up at night as we grow, I feel like when we started with one location, we just had something so special. And we've been so fortunate that although each one of our studios, um, you know, we really want them to be uh, cohesive and consistent and part of our brand, um, you know, that's hard to do as you scale. So I think really, um, you know, staying true to the of me brand is so important to us. Um, and also maintaining culture and really ultimately, again, growing our human capital, find the right people that align with our brand um, and align with our values and our culture. And I think that, um, you know, that's, that's what gets me excited when I find that person. I mean, it's like, you know, the unicorn, if you will, um, that where all the stars align. Um, and that's what drives me is that um, desire to find people like that. Um, and be able to, you know, I get, I get excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to act calm because you know, it's still the beginning of the process, but I almost, it's weird. Sometimes you just know right away and I just get so excited because I know what they're looking for and, um, you know, their, their challenges. I hear all the challenges and the, you know, people come to me because they're looking to find a different job. And so I hear the reasons why they're looking. And I get really excited when I feel like we can solve those problems for them and um, they can help build our brand and make it even stronger and we can give them, you know, a really great home. Well, it's funny you just said you get so excited because I just had a call before we jumped on this podcast with my director of sales We're looking for a new hire. We found the perfect person and we were both like dancing because yes. it's just like, it's like the clouds parted and the sun, you know, shines through and you find your unicorns. I totally yes. get it. And I think as a hiring manager, I deal with this every day, as do you. You invest so much time in people when you hire them 
And you have to just hope, cross your fingers and pray that they stay or that they are who they say they are or that things come to fruition that we talked about in our, you know, in our onboarding or in our interview process. And it's a very risky proposition. Like I, I understand it and you're doing it at a much bigger scale than I am with a lot more people and a lot more, you know, a lot more roles. I don't envy you, but I envy your ability to do it so well because I feel like you guys have kept the culture. Your locations all look and feel and have the same vibe. You know, it's very consistent. So just from a high level thinking through that, when you hire someone and bring them into the culture, what are the kinds of things that you do to ingrain them in it? Like what are the big things in onboarding that make them like, ah, oh, I'm an of me person. I belong here. Um, you know, honestly, the most important thing at the end of the at the end of the day that I really truly believe in is, you know, I always say, and it's maybe not, I don't know, I, I, I'm maybe not the most appropriate person, but I always say you can't pick up where your mother, I can't pick up where your mother left off. Meaning, you preach, know, preach, you preach, can't preach. teach somebody to just be a, a good person at the end of the day. Um, you know, I really strongly believe, you know, that you can teach somebody cannula, for example, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if their ethics are, you know, not in alignment with our brand, they're never going to be. Um, so really it's vetting um, and, you know, taking the fact that you are offering somebody a job that, you know, I take that very seriously. It's a very serious responsibility. Um, if we don't, if we have a studio that's already open, I'm ultimately placing this person with, um, you know, eight or 10 other people that they have to interact with this person on a daily basis. And I want them to be happy. Um, you know, I always say my commitment to the people that I work with is that, you know, no matter who you are, I want you to look forward to coming to work and enjoy coming to work and feel safe there and happy there. I mean, we're all working hard, but we're around these people more than we're around our own family. Um, and also I take it as a huge responsibility to the candidate. Um, it's irresponsible for me to hire somebody that ultimately I feel like is not going to be the right fit um, in some way for our company culture. Um, because, you know, I can look at someone's resume um, and they can have all of those requirements, but if they are somebody that is not going to fit into the company culture, um, you know, we're doing them a disservice by hiring them. And, you know, we're also missing out on, you know, once we find somebody and we make that commitment, we stop looking, right? So, um, you know, also there's that opportunity cost. And so, like you said, it is, it's risky. It's people. So they're unpredictable. And, you know, obviously there's, uh, there's cases where, you know, we've been burned where somebody comes in and they try to, you know, present themselves in a way that's different than who they may really be. And you tend to find that out relatively quickly when you have a healthy culture, um, they kind of weed themselves out. But fortunately, you know, the few times that that's happened, um, you know, it's disappointing, obviously, but I don't really focus on that because there's so many more times where you really find that people, you know, they blow you away, they impress you and they grow in ways that you can't even imagine. And it's so exciting to me when you give somebody an opportunity that maybe they've been in the industry two years and you just equip them with, a, with the right environment and with the right tools to succeed. And, you know, you see them and they've just grown and they've like, put so much energy and effort into it that that's what gets me so excited, excited at the end of the day. That's why, you know, I love my job so much because, um, you know, that's, you make an impact on their lives and they really appreciate it. And it's so exciting for me because so many times when we hire someone, you know, the most common message I get once they start working is they'll text me and they're like, I know you said that you have a good culture, but seriously, these women are incredible. And I say women because we have all women working in our studios now. So it'd be great to <laughs> have some men as well. But, um, you know, like, it's, in, it's just a really exciting feeling because what we're doing, I think um, our clients feel it and that's why they come back. Um, and it's something that's authentic and you can't fake but really it's the energy in the office. And um, as long as we keep that going, we'll be able to retain really incredible talent. Uh, everything you just said, I wanted to, if I were on Instagram, I'd be liking it and putting hearts on it because <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And we're going to go into some more of the dramatic parts of, of when it goes wrong. Because I think what you're saying about culture and weeding people out and that their true colors will show quickly is so important. 
you know, we, we interview a lot here. We, we hire people, you know, quite often. And you get that vibe from people about, you know, I'm just not sure. I can't put my finger on it, but something's not, something's not right here. And I just had a discussion last week about, you know, if your ethics are, to your point, your ethics are bad, your character is bad, I don't care how good you are at your job, you can't be here because it has to be a holistic employee because we're, we're servicing the whole employee. They're servicing all of our customers. It's got to be all in or nothing. But to that point, here's my first loaded question for you. Would you rather hire a nurse injector who has a lot of experience and a big following or one that is maybe two years into your point, starting out and eager to be developed? And there is no right answer, but I'm just curious. You know, we, we look at both. I mean, you know, we really ultimately at the end of the day, what we're looking for is um, somebody that's super passionate about our industry, super passionate about our brand. And, you know, they really are the right culture fit. What I can say is that if you have that injector that's been injecting a really long time and she has a huge following, um, you know, and she has a book of business, of course, that's valuable, right? In our industry, it's huge. I remember I read this Allergan research study last summer that they put out and they said that I believe 82% of all millennial women, um, they're finding their injectors through Instagram and in social media in the US. So, I mean, that can't be overlooked. But that being said, um, you know, if that same injector has a poor attitude or they're a diva um, and they're going to be disrespectful to the other staff um, or creating a really bad work environment, that's dangerous, right? Because what that ends up doing is um, polluting the entire studio. So, you know, that's something that's not going to work for us. Um, and that's a short term gain. So I think that, you know, ultimately that person would end up um, ruining our culture. And that's, that's what makes us special. And, you know, our clients feel that it's, again, um, if we have an environment where people are unhappy, they're not going to want to come to us. There's way too many um, choices out there, right? And so I would say that um, if it was the case of somebody that's a poor culture fit, even if they have a huge book of business, that we would definitely rather go with somebody that, you know, is a really incredible person and they're there because um, it's not just about them. They're there because they genuinely, truly are in this industry to help women feel more confident and, you know, they're passionate about, um, you know, personal development and being part of the team, then that's going to be somebody that really aligns with our culture and that um, I personally would, you know, push forward ahead of the other person just because they have a big following. Well, so for those of you listening to put that in some bullet points here is the most important thing is a job fit, a culture fit. And I think that we in this industry for sure, because patients are hard to come by, we're very competitive, we're doing Google ads, pay-per-click, Instagram, you know, all the things to get patients in that to get an easy button of a really big following is, you know, for a business owner, fantastic. But it doesn't come without challenges if the person has a bad cultural fit or they're not the right person for the job. So I always caution people to not get blinded by the shiny things and make sure that the whole person fits really well in the culture. And I think that's one of the reasons that your culture has stayed so consistent is because you guys have really focused on no matter who you are, if you don't fit here, you don't fit here. And I feel like that's, as a culture protector, a culture keeper, that's like your job, right? Like you're the... You're the last person, you're on the, the top of the totem pole to make sure that everything stays really consistent. So I ask that question because it's always controversial, but it also lends itself into, you know, how do you prevent the drama? Because you just said you have all women. God bless your soul. We'll get you some men after the podcast. Men, go go apply it of me. But how do you keep the drama, and that could be any gender, by the way, how do you keep the drama out of the workplace? Because, again, aesthetics is very competitive. How do you guys curtail that and make it more of a team-focused environment? I think we do that a couple different ways. And we actually, I mean, that's probably one of the main things that I'm, that people are surprised with the most. And I would say, um, you know, one of the main things that I hear when I'm interviewing candidates and I ask them why they're looking to leave, a lot of the time it's just the toxic work culture. And um, many times it's the fact that there's a lot of drama where they are. And I think really that's just through an intentional culture. Um, you know, when we, don't have a culture, then, you know, most times it's not going to become healthy. So we have a very intentional, clear culture. Um, you know, we, we're clear that we don't do drama. Um, and if people are, you know, the type that maybe are going to be full of drama, to be honest, they're probably not going to make it through the hiring process. Um, 
if they do, um, you know, have issues with somebody, our expectation is that they're going to go directly to that person and just deal with it. Um, just like you would handle anyone that you care about, giving them the benefit of the doubt and, you know, really assuming positive intent at the end of the day. Um, I think also we have um, a system where we reward people for being kind to one another um, and, you know, really kind of um, giving shout outs to each other. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I'm acting serious now, but I, I mean, I'm always <laughs> joking around. I'm, you know, I think just having fun a fun environment, like what we're doing, I mean, there's so much fun in what we do. So I think when you do that, um, you know, you really, those things sound simple, but at the end of the day, that helps people feel like we have an inclusive environment and they're part of um, contributing to that. And then also that they're supported at the end of the day. So, um, you know, I think that that's really ultimately how we try to prevent trauma. I mean, there's always going to be disagreements with people, but really surprisingly, and I'm not just saying this, I mean, we, we rarely have any issues with drama. Well, I'm jealous of that. We don't, we really don't either in our culture at our company, but I know so many medical spas. I was a, a rep for Galderma before coming into this role, worked in training and there was drama everywhere because you're in so many practices every day and you just hear it. And injectors are going from place to place, trying to find a good fit to your point. They're not happy. Things are crazy. And you sort of see this transient culture of people going from one place to the other, just looking for their home because to your point, it's toxic in places. But as I think about that, one of the things that I struggle with personally, and as I do hiring is these things like predictive indexes, you know, do you put them through some kind of a, a battery, like an assessment test? Are they a good job fit? What is their acumen for, you know, people issues like emotional intelligence or is it business acumen? Do you do things like that? Any sort of testing before they come in? Do you do like an on the job shadow day? What are some of the things that you do to weed them out in the beginning? Sure. Um, it depends on each. Uh, we have our own system based off of each individual role. Um, but the big thing for us is, you know, we really believe in transparency. And so I think that, um, you know, we do a screening, um, we will have them meet always with multiple people and leadership. Um, it's never going to be just me. Um, you know, I always want a second or possibly third opinion. We love meeting people in person. Um, you know, we will spend money to fly people in or go to see them um, because you really can't replace that face-to-face -face, um, meeting. And also, you know, we really value all of our other employees. Um, so if we're hiring somebody to be in our Dallas studio, for example, um, you know, we want that employee, uh, that potential new hire to meet our employees. And, you know, we're going to hear the feedback from our team. And if they like them, you know, that goes really far. We're not just here, um, you know, telling people, okay, here, this is going to be a great culture fit for you, or you're going to like this person now deal with it. Um, we really truly want to hear what they feel and what they believe. And um, we want them to get sign off on the person as well. And then of course, more importantly, there's the person that's um, interviewing for the job. You know, we want them to feel comfortable and we want to hear their feedback. I always say, look, this is a two way street. You know, I don't want you to feel like, you know, just we're interviewing you. I encourage you to do your due diligence. You know, I love if I have a candidate and they reach out to our other injectors or, you know, they go and they mystery shop and they want to see what it's like. I, I mean, absolutely everyone should be doing that at um, any at any opportunity that they can because that's how you're really going to see um, just like what I'm trying to find out I want to know who you really are I don't want to know who you are during this interview that does that does nothing for me um, so the more time I can spend with a candidate the better um, face to face and also the more that they can really understand what what we are they'll be able to tell us I always ask them over and over again like you know do you feel like you know, this is the right fit for you. And that's, that's more important than if we feel like we're the right fit for them. I mean, they know themselves more than we do at that point. I love what you said about two-way street, because I find so common with candidates that they forget that they're interviewing you. Like, come with your questions, not because you look good asking them, but because you need to know what you're getting into. I don't want to over-promise and under-deliver any more than they do, right? So it's like, you've got to ask me things too, because I need to make sure that I'm giving you a true picture of our life here. 
So if you're a job candidate looking right now, make sure that you come prepared and do your research because it is for sure a two-way street. And in our industry especially, because we have such a shortage of, of really great injectors who are you know fantastic with patients, great at sales, good in business, the talent pool is not all that all that deep. So you you can be choicey if you're a really great injector, really great talent, and really in any industry. So I love the idea of making sure they, they interview you as well. Um, as I you know as I think through that, do you guys really focus on resume? You, I, you mentioned before that the resumes don't really matter compared to like the culture fit and you know the in person interview. But what are things that we should be looking for on resumes? Whether it's hiring for front desk staff, hiring for an injector, what are your big hot button keywords or or prior kinds of experience that you like to see on a new hire? Sure. I mean, just to um, add in, I, resume and qualifications definitely do matter um, yes, to us. Course. Patient yeah. um, outcomes is at the forefront of everything that we do, especially, um, you know, our CEO being a doctor, he really cares about that as the number one requirement. So, I mean, we are always looking at where people went to school, um, you know, any additional trainings that they've done on or off label, um, you know, we are huge in terms of um, continuous ongoing education. The fact that our industry is always evolving and changing is super exciting. So, you know, when we get a candidate and they're an injector, for example, and you can tell if they're really passionate about the industry and they're the right um, type of fit because they're constantly investing in themselves. And um, because we are a large company, you know, we'll continue to invest in them. And I think that's one of my biggest tools that I have in my toolbox, if you will, when we're um, recruiting and, you know, trying to attack, attract top talent is that, you know, we are not going to ever um, be salesy, right? We're going to be an expert and we're going to be a guide. And that's what we ask um, our injectors to do during their consults is really just educate clients and the more tools that they have in their toolbox, the more powerful that consult is going to be. So at the end of the day, I really believe we're educators um, because there's so much misinformation out there, um, especially with all the noise with social media. Um, you know, there's so much dangerous and bad information out there. So our expectation is that we're going to hire somebody that, um, really has a solid knowledge um, and background of our industry and is continuing to invest in themselves by doing additional trainings. Um, and then also, you know, somebody that isn't jumping around a lot, you know, it's a red flag for me when I see somebody and they can't stay somewhere more than a year. Um, because especially as an injector, you know, you gain a following. So it's a big um, move to move from one practice to another, sometimes you'll lose patients and they, you know, you're never going to get them back. Um, so, you know, for me, really somebody that it seems like, you know, they, they like to kind of stick around. We don't like attrition. So we spend a lot of time, money and resources to onboard and train our staff and, you know, continue to do training. Anytime we have somebody that's interested in something that they want to learn, we never turn them down. And I think that's really rare. Um, and so that's, um, that's something that we can offer, you know, somebody that wants to work for us where they may not get that in other, um, you know, smaller um, studios. And so, you know, I think for us, in terms of a resume, you know, make it clean. Also, one thing I can't emphasize this enough, I really like when people put pictures on their resume because we're, we're going through so many resumes and it's hard to remember. And when I see a name with the face um, on the resume, it just makes it so much easier, I think. Um, and it also just brings the, the resume to life. Um, so I think that that's something that I would definitely recommend is just the way the resume looks. Um, if it's nice and clean, if there's no, I know it goes without saying, but no errors, um, you know, that's, that's huge. And definitely just highlighting any additional trainings because I have a lot of um, resumes that I see and then I'll speak to the candidate and I wonder what, wait, you've done all this stuff. Why didn't you put this on your resume? You know? And so I think that's huge putting, if you have an Instagram handle, put it on your resume. Um, I think that's huge. The, the less digging around that I have to do, the more I'm going to like you because I'm busy. Um, and you know, that's a valuable asset. So I definitely think that, 
um, those would be kind of the things that I look for when I see somebody doing that. I'm like, okay, they kind of get it. Um, they're, they're bringing their brand to life and they're looking at themselves as a brand. So that's such great advice on how we look for an injector, which is top of mind for all of us in, in the aesthetics industry. But I want to know how you guys look for an office manager, or as you guys call it, a studio manager to lead your teams and your locations. You know, I think that the office manager really sets the tone for the entire studio. And especially when we're headquartered in um, Atlanta, they're functioning really as an owner, essentially, when, you know, even though we are high touch um, and we're always either there in person, you know, even before we were speaking, I was laughing because you thought I lived in Dallas because I'm there so much because that's from where we just opened our last studio. Um, you know, I think we offer lots of support, um, but really we're looking for an office manager who has the eyes of an owner um, and somebody that is going to, um, you know, really be, you know, the type of person that's going to roll up their sleeves and get stuff done. Um, you know, I think ultimately at the end of the day, we're all like that. I always laugh because when um, our CEO Mark goes into a studio, I mean, the first thing he's doing is taking out the trash and, you know, taking his magic eraser and if there's a scuff on the wall, you know, he's not the person that's going to, um, you know, point at something and tell somebody to do it. He just does it. And that's, um, that's part of our culture. And that's how we all are. We just do whatever it takes. And we have a whatever it takes attitude. Um, and we all want to help one another out. You know, we're all busy. Um, and we're fortunate that, you know, our studios are all, you know, busy, especially at this time right now. Um, and we don't take it for granted. So I think that, um, when I'm looking for a studio manager, I want somebody that um, really has pride in ownership um, and treats that studio like it's their own, but also is really going to be the backbone of the studio. And um, I want her to be the support system that that studio needs. So that way, any of our um, staff in that studio, they feel like they can go to her for anything that they need. And, it, and she's going to be able to get it done, get it resolved, or sometimes just be there emotionally if they had a rough day. You know, I want her to be the type of person that, um, you know, they can turn to. And, you know, if you have somebody like that leading your studio, that studio is going to be successful. So I love what you said about your studio managers and their roll up their sleeves attitude, getting the job done. And I think about you, you just said that you're having to live in the cities where you open these studios, but you have to go home eventually. So one of the things that I personally am terrible at is delegating. I want to be in every place at all times doing all the jobs. You're obviously much better at it than I am. So walk us through how you've either learned to be a good delegator or how you entrust others to grow your business when you're not there to do it yourself. Well, thank you for feeling that way. I, I definitely don't feel that way at all. Um, you know, I think that um, I would love to be able to be in, in each, you know, location at once. That's kind of um, the biggest challenge, I think. Um, we all feel that way. Um, I think really now that I've been doing it, the biggest thing that I realized is that since you can't be there all the time, the most important thing is that um, when you are in a studio, you have to be present and you have to make the most of your time. Um, you know, I used to kind of go in and try to also answer emails or be on the phone. And, um, and really, there's no point in me being there at all at that point. So um, especially when for me personally, I'm tasked with um, really owning the culture piece of our business. Um, if you're not present, then you're worthless. So I really go in there. I, I turn everything off and I just talk to people and try to find out what's going on and try to understand any, um, anything that I can be helpful with and any issues that, you know, they're going through and really what's happening in that studio that, um, may be preventing us from, you know, moving to the next mark, I guess, with our business. So really just being as present as possible. Also, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, video instead of phone. And that was even before we had to, you know, all get we on Zoom to. with, um, 
with what we're going through. So I think nothing can replace face-to-face -face contact, but um, even more so just because you're there and you're just a body. And if you're not present, um, then you're really not making the most of your time and you're not, there's no value. I feel like you're calling me out right now because I am... <laughs> I am so bad at that. Cause you know, Crystal, if you think about our, our lives, I think myself as well, <laughs> I have 9,857 emails unopened in my inbox right now. Yeah. I work like 20 something hours a day and I still cannot keep up. So to your point, I have a really hard time of just shutting it off. I look at my phone constantly when I'm doing things, because if I don't, it just keeps adding up and piling up. But I think what you're saying is like a message we should all hear is when you're in a clinic with an employee in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, whatever it is, you got to shut it all out and just listen and be present. And I'm like you saying that today of all days for me is really important because I am not doing that right now really well as a, as a leader, because there's just so much happening with COVID and all these things that we're all going through the rapid switching and the rapid changing of our environment is it's almost overwhelming at times. I, I don't know if you guys feel that way, but I'm for sure feeling that way right now. It's just a lot happening. Or, I I totally agree. And I mean, I think that, um, you know, I learned that lesson because I, I remember um, actually I was walking into a studio and I was on a conference call and I had um, headphones in and with my hair and nobody could see. And I just wanted to rush in um, and get in the back, open my laptop because I got off the plane and check my emails. And, um, you know, one of our patient care coordinators, I guess she said hi to me and I just completely didn't hear her and ignored her and her from her perception and she came in the back and she just felt that you know she was hurt because she said that you know she felt like I said hi to everybody else um, at one point and when she had said hi to me earlier I just ignored her and it made her feel like she wasn't important enough to be spoken to in some way and that was heartbreaking to me but it was a huge wake-up call um, because you know, that's absolutely everything that I'm against. Um, you know, I think actually our patient care coordinators are the most important people in our office, sorry, injectors, <laughs> but I'll say that to their face as well. But really, you know, I call them the directors of first and last impressions. Um, and, you know, they deal with so much and they're our MVPs. And so, um, you know, she came in the back and she actually was in tears because she just was really hurt. And I'm so grateful for her giving me that feedback. And, um, you know, that was kind of where I, I had a little bit of a paradigm shift. And I realized, look, I know I'm trying to manage a lot of things, but if I'm going to be here, I have to be here and be present. And that's something that I um, owe to myself to do my, my job in the best way possible. But more importantly, I owe that to, you know, everyone that I work with in the teams. I never want anyone to feel like, you know, their time is invaluable in some way. Well, you just dropped two bombs that I think are like bring the message home. So you said two things there that made me just stop in my tracks. One is about the director of the first and last experience. I can't tell you the countless amount of people I've dealt with who their front desk person is the least paid person on their team or the least qualified, not intentionally, just say maybe they don't have a business degree or any sort of a degree, or they don't have a lot of experience. They're someone's cousin who's come in for vacation and they're, they decided to stay, you know, all these, these stories that you hear. And I've always been so shocked by that because they're the billboard for your brand. A patient walks in your clinic or your office or your studio and the first person that they interact with is your, either your patient coordinator or your front desk coordinator. Like to me, that's where you have to like hit a home run every single time. And hearing you say that just reinforces that that's got to be such a pivotal role in your in your studio. Like I love that you that you focus on that. And the second part of it is you said that you took the feedback. As leaders, we are so guilty of not taking the feedback. And I think people who are great leaders, you look at like a Doug McMillan at Walmart, you look at even like an Elon Musk, these people who are doing amazing things, they're taking feedback constantly and they're evolving and getting better. And that's how they're so successful. And to hear you say, I took the feedback and I acted on it, did something differently. I think is what makes it, it's a mark of a truly great leader. I'm guilty of sometimes not doing it, but to hear you say it and, and see how much it changed your perception and your perspective, I think is really valuable. But tell me again about the front desk coordinator, or the patient coordinators. What kind of person do you look for in that, in that particular job or that role? You know, I think um, really somebody that has really great customer service experience um, is huge. I really, you know, kind of tend to 
not necessarily hire just people in our industry because I think that, um, you know, I was given an opportunity. I came from architecture. I did business development and, you know, although I helped build, you know, an architecture firm um, and introduce them to new markets, um, you know, I remember just feeling I didn't value those transferable skills maybe in a way that I, I could have um, and that kept me stuck in that industry for, you know, much longer than I would have um, otherwise. So, you know, I always look at that and I now I see how those transferable skills that I had, um, they really paid off um, and they really ultimately set me up for success in many ways in this role, um, even though it's unconventional and I didn't have, you know, a strong aesthetics background. So I just look at people that have transferable skills that have, again, that culture fit. Um, and so that allows me to really have a much larger pool of candidates to hire from um, rather than just, okay, you've worked in a Durham practice for 10 years, um, so you can get the job done. I think, um, show me how you've really dealt with people in, um, in the areas where you've had to deliver high quality customer service. I like that high quality, not just customer service, high quality customer service. Exactly. So what's on the docket as you guys think about your next move as, as an of me collection of studios, where do you guys go from here? Cause post COVID our lives are all crazy different. I'm hearing you have great talent. You have great hiring. You've got your onboarding in place. What do you do next? Well, I'm really excited to talk about what we do next. Cause I'm always looking ahead. Um, the next thing that we're doing is our Chicago opening. So we're really gearing up for that. Um, we are going to be opening there this fall. And, you know, we have our team um, pretty much completely baked for that opening. Um, we're super excited. We have some fun tricks up our sleeves to launch there. And um, after that, really, we have Houston, Texas, we're going to be opening there in January. We have Bethesda, Maryland. We're opening there February 1st. Um, right after that, we're opening in Franklin, Tennessee, March 1st. Um, and so really, you know, the thing that's exciting for me is that we are one of the few, you know, businesses um, that are actively hiring. So if there's any injectors or estheticians, <laughs> studio managers, patient care coordinators that, you know, are looking for jobs and you're interested in working in those markets, um, please, you know, check us out. See if you, you know, you think that we might be the right fit for you. Um, I, you can reach me directly at crystal at ofme.com and send me a resume, or you can go to our website at ofme.com backslash careers and all of our active listings are posted there. So you guys are growing extremely fast in the post COVID world, which proves that it can be done. So, you know, from, from that perspective, do you run a very lean environment because you're able to be profitable enough to keep investing right now and others are contracting at a, at a pretty significant rate. So don't give us all the secrets, obviously, but what are a couple of things that you guys are doing that are allowing you to keep growing in amongst this really unknown environment? Um, well, I don't know if any of us sleep, first of all. <laughs> None of us do. No, no I'm just kidding. Um, you know, honestly, we do have a really lean team. Um, you know, we, we also just, the nature of the people that work here, I think, um, you know, our CEO, he has the energy of probably five people. It's insane. And so, you know, just, we're all super passionate about what we're doing. And so, you know, we, we're not afraid of failing fast. It's not an environment where, you know, we're afraid to do things. We're all coming from different um, backgrounds, actually, you know, other than our CEO outside of um, the aesthetics industry. So, um, you know, we are trying to always stay ahead of the curve and um, always try to get better. And we always want to grow, but not at the expense of us losing track of kind of what makes us um, unique, which is our brand. And so we're always asking ourselves, um, no matter what detail, if it's, you know, if it's small or large, we're always asking ourselves if something is on or off brand. Um, and that means a lot of different things to us. But ultimately, um, you know, I think that 
we do need more help and we are even hiring on a corporate level, which I'm super excited about. Um, you know, so I think we'll have some, uh, just, we'll have the ability to do so much more within the next year, just based off of um, some of the candidates that we're bringing on at a corporate level as well. You're going to need it because you're going to have to have sleep eventually. And that's going to be a lot of, if you're trying to be in all the places at one time, you're going to have to get some clones of yourself to make that work. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, neurotoxin can only go so far and I'm really <laughs> pushing the limits. <laughs> Agree. And hair dye. I'm turning gray from all the stress. So I don't know about you, but I'm naturally very dark headed and it's, it's coming through in the post COVID world. Trust me. <laughs> but to your own personal experiences in 2020, obviously surviving in aesthetics, especially as a leader in a role as big as yours requires you at some point to decompress, to do something other than just working. So what are the things that you're interested in that really help with your professional and personal nourishment beyond just working all day? Cause I don't have any of these things. So I want to know things I should go do. Yeah, I know. I'm like, wait, there's life outside of it. No, I'm joking. Um, you know, honestly, I have a just a personal goal with our CEO, with Mark. Um, we challenge each other. We, we both love reading a lot. So we have a challenge where we're both going to read 30 books by the end of the year. And so um, I'm chugging along slowly but surely doing that um, separately. I really hope that travel kind of starts to pick up again because I love traveling for fun. Um, but, you know, also I want to get involved in more events and forums to just kind of share my knowledge um, with people that are looking to get in our industry. I think it's um, one of those industries that a lot of people kind of, they're curious about, right? They, they don't know how to get into it initially. Um, and I get that question a lot. People actually message me all the time on Instagram, um, just asking, you know, I want to become an injector. I'm going to nursing school. How do I go about doing that? Um, or estheticians that are interested in getting, you know, into the medical side. Um, so I think that that's something that I'm really passionate about um, is just being able to kind of share the knowledge that I've gained in the short amount of time um, with people that would love to be in this industry because it's such an incredible industry and it's so rewarding. Um, and I think that there's still this barrier um, where once you're in it, you're in it. Um, but it can be a little, you know, kind of intimidating to people. They don't know where to begin. I would agree with that. I came from a non-beauty environment. I came from ophthalmology and optometry, and it was a much different world. And I was very, not nervous, that's not the right word, but it was a little bit different to be in a room full of all these beautiful people who have all these great connections, selling all these things, understand the industry, I didn't. So it was much, you know, I would love to have had a you there to, to tell me, hey, you can come from a non-industry or non-aesthetics industry and be successful here. Because it took me a minute to get adjusted in the beginning to just how different things were from what I was used to. So as we finish up here, one last thing, let's talk about Pilates. You're a workout fiend. Do you feel like you have to exercise to stay, to stay sane? Um, yes, I do. Actually, I'm, I'm a certified Pilates instructor. I got my certification, um, Geez, I'm going to age myself, but I think probably like eight years ago, I've been doing Pilates now for probably 12 years. Um, once I started, I just fell in love. Um, and really for me, it's kind of my moving meditation. So that's um, how I like to start my mornings. I'm a morning person. Um, all my friends think I'm insane, but I, I'll wake up at 530 and just, I can wake up easily when I know I'm going to go get my workout in. Um, and then I just feel great the rest of the day. So, I mean, I can talk about beauty all day long, but um, really I think that I'm just trying to convert one person at a time to over to Pilates just because it's really just changed my body. It's changed my mind. And, um, you know, I, I just love it. It's super exciting for me. And, you know, it's similar to, um, you know, the beauty industry. I just think it's important to invest in yourself. And for me, I'm not motivated to do Pilates to get in shape. Of course, that's the number one thing. That's a great um, product of working out. But, um, you know, really at the end of the day, it, it helps me just kind of clear my mind. And in Pilates, you have to be so focused on the movement. It's all about proprioce proprioception, that mind-body connection. So, um, you know, I'm always thinking all day about, um, you know, what we're doing next, um, what we can do better. And, you know, it just allows me that 50 minutes to just 
almost clear my mind. And when you're doing it, you can't think about anything else. Um, and there's something that's really powerful for me um, as it relates to that. Well, you have been a phenomenal guest, Crystal. And, you know, I, I kept thinking I won't learn anything more from you. Like, I can't keep learning things. But I think I'm going to go try Pilates now, too. So like, you just convinced good. me. We can do it when I come to, <laughs> when I can finally come back to Texas. Well, I just think what you said about, like, centering yourself in something and focusing on it so intensely. I did CrossFit for years, and I felt the same way. But I was getting too beaten up. But I think to your point, this, you know, this job that you have, the job that I had that many of us have, it's so rapid. It's so intense, so chaotic. And you have to be healthy to be able to survive. You know, this this show is really about surviving in this you know in this industry, and I think that's a big part of it. You're reading, you're doing your move meditation, you're you know you're focused on Pilates, you're focused on culture and people, and I think you're investing in, in the right things, and we're seeing it manifest itself into a really successful brand that you built. So, I think you I think you've got it nailed. So we should all keep learning from you. So give us your Instagram handle so we can all go follow you on Instagram. Everybody, please follow me, Director of Beauty. There's no spaces or anything. And, um, you know, thank you so much, Tiffany. I really had a great time, and I appreciate you inviting me here. Well, for the record, we have enjoyed having you, and we will be checking out all of your new locations coming in the next few months. And we wish you incredible success, and we'll see you in September at Aesthetic Next. Thank you. I can't wait. Thanks so much, Crystal. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Record. This podcast is not intended to provide legal or medical advice. It's for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. For more information on this week's guest or to get started with Aesthetic Record, email us at info at aestheticrecord.com. Be sure to tune in next week for more fresh perspectives on disrupting the status quo and surviving in the aesthetics industry.